All right, everyone. So I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker. Beth Tweedy is a STEM librarian in life services, or excuse me, life sciences as a part of researcher services at UC Davis. Take it away, Beth. There we go. Um, thank you all for having me here. Uh, so I, if you look at the schedule, you'll notice there's a different name on there, and that's because Emily Atkinson, who is the Librarian for Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, was supposed to give this talk. She had to unexpectedly go on family leave for very positive reasons recently. So I found out on Monday evening that I was going to be giving this talk. Um, I also, in the last month, have moved cross country from Oklahoma to here and just started a new job, so I'm going to do the best I can here. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, this will be an adventure together. Um, a little bit about myself, so I have a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology. I did research in Oklahoma on the Kaimichi watershed, which if you pay attention to water battles in the flyover states, it actually had a US Supreme Court case there about water right usage and things. Um, after my PhD, I figured out I was actually better at helping other people with their research than doing research on my own. So I made the jump over to libraries, and so uh, that's kind of why I'm here, is to talk about some of the things that we can do for you at UC Davis with the library. If you're not at UC Davis, we can probably still help you, or at your own institutions, I promise you there's lots of librarians there who want to help you as well. Um, so what we want, kind of want to cover, uh, to kind of preface this talk a little bit, this isn't going to be a super technical how-to talk. Um, this is more just kind of giving you some ideas to think about, um, things that you want to be aware of, and then some resources to look at with the idea that you can reach out to me, other librarians in your life, things like that, to come up with more hard plans and things like that. Um, here at UC Davis for sure, and libraries in general, data, working with things like that is a huge thing that we're all interested in, we're all thinking about. Um, so there's lots of people out there that are eager to help with things like that. Um, so talk a little bit about data documentation, how you do it, why you do it, um, important considerations there. Um, thinking about how you're creating your metadata, your standards, be consistent, things like that. Um, some tools for collaborative data sharing, some suggestions there, a little bit of things to consider about that. Um, a little bit about citing data sets, authorship, some of the benefits to putting your data out there. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit at the end about some data repositories that I think might be useful for the different types of research you all do, talk about some strengths and weaknesses with those, um, and uh, then hopefully have some time for some questions if you all have them. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so starting here with data documentation and metadata. Um, so why is this important? The most important thing I think about this is to be kind to future you. Um, so future you is going to need to do stuff with this. And right now it's all crystal clear because you're immersed in it and you're remembering all of it and it's super easy. Um, but if you think back to what you were doing six months ago, how clear are those projects right now? Or a year or five years or 10 years? And especially with the sort of the work you all do, you know, 10 year old data can still be really valuable, really important looking on those time scales. Um, so thinking about making future you's life much easier, future you will thank current you for doing this. Um, some specific benefits, so if you have good documentation of your data, and we'll talk in a bit what that looks like, um, but it's gonna allow people, including yourself, to track how that data was used, where it came from, what happened to it, uh, and the more work you put into upfront in kind of uh, doing that down, the better it's gonna be for people trying to understand that and the details of the work. It makes your science more reproducible, it makes it more shareable, more citable, things like that. Um, it's also going to reduce the likelihood that you forget things. Um, I had a positive story about this with some of my master's thesis data. Uh, a student that came in seven or eight years after I did my thesis wanted to do a similar one, and I all of a sudden got this email that's like, hey, how did you do this? How did you transform this data? What did you do for your mercury things? And thankfully, because I had done computer program before that, I had an extensive list of this is how I did all of these processes, things like that. So with you know an afternoon of digging back into those files, I was able to find the data, meet with this graduate student, talk them through, this is what I did, here's some things to consider, here's some things that didn't work, um, as opposed to panicking and sitting there trying to rack my brain like I had on some other projects, being like, I have no idea what I did, did I even do it right? 
Um, and then uh, it's going to help you for more selfish reasons as well. It's going to make your data um, easier to find, properly cite. So if you care about citations, getting your data used, things like that, if it's well documented, people aren't going to uh, look at it and be like, this just isn't worth the trouble and walk away. Um, it's also, um, so there's the selfish side of that, also for the good of your field, things like that. That data you can collect was, you know, kind of some of the earlier talks we're talking about, sharing that data between different groups, getting them on the same page. Um, that's going to make it so other people can use that data too, and so it's going to be more impactful, more worthwhile. Um, so, hopefully you're convinced that it's important to document your data. Um, what are some of the things that you should consider documenting about your data here? Um, so context of your data collection. So writing down uh, in files, whatever you're doing, what's the context? Why are you doing it? Who's involved? Uh, things like that uh, to make it clear um, why you're doing it, what the context is, um, what your methodology is, so what tools you're using, what file format you're putting it into, where you're storing them, what the procedures about, uh, you know, wh how you're naming your columns, how you're naming your files, what your conventions are around that. Um, making sure that you have a good thought out structure for organizing your files, so it's not just like project one, data, other stuff, miscellaneous, and then data, final, underscore, final, really. No, this is actually the final version. Um, so having some plans around that to make sure that it uh, makes sense. And uh, by kind of striking a balance between consistent naming and things like that, it makes it so if you hand the project off to a graduate student or a colleague or something like that, if it's well named, well thought out, they can scan through that uh, data structure and easily get a grasp for what the project is instead of it just being a whole bunch of nonsense. Um, documenting things about your data validation, your quality assurance, that can give people who are working with the data in the future confidence that it's good data. Also protects you if someone questions your data in the future. You have all of that documented to be able to show that. Um, and then even, you know, thinking about your data manipulations. If you're converting raw data into formatted data, writing down how you did that, what the scripts were, where those scripts are, um, what the process was, who did them, who wrote them, things like that. And then also being mindful of documenting your data, what there is for data confidentiality. Um, you know, if you're working with private industry or things like that, they may have considerations about that that are important to note in that data. Thinking through how far versus anybody take it and use it to I want to keep this private and secure. Um, and documenting that in the data so it's clear how you expect that data, thinking through your copyright, licensing, things like that. Um, this is not meant for you to read. This is just meant to show you that there are lots of sources out there. Uh, UCL Libraries has a great one. Um, you can Google, you know, or web search, uh, you know, how to make a readme file, things like that, and find lists like this that walk through a lot of the things that you want to be thinking of, who the funders are, how you're processing the data, sources, things like that. But actually, you know, getting a list ahead of time to help you think through what all of these different things you might want to be thinking about are, what makes sense for your projects, your context, things like that can be helpful. Um, as far as how to create metadata, um, I work in a library. Um, we do a lot of thinking about metadata and how we do it. For the projects that most of you all are going to be working on, um, a readme-style metadata is usually perfectly fine. So if you've ever downloaded a project, or you know, a file or a program or something, and you open it up, and in there there's a README file that most of us probably don't read. Um, I don't always read it, but a lot of times if you actually do read it, you can find answers to a lot of the questions, problems, things you're having there. Um, so having README files within your things that you go in and update and document this stuff in. Um, Cornell has a really great guide that walks you through the basic steps of creating a README file, thinking about what format you're putting it in, shareability, future-proofing it, what information to put in there, how to write it, things like that. Um, if you want to take it a step further, either for your own sake or because of funder requirements or things like that, uh, there's specific metadata tools that are designed to do this in a more rigorous, kind of formulatic way. Um, Morpho is an example of a tool that may be useful to some of you in this room that can help you come up with more strict, reliable, consistent ways to do your metadata, and that's something that we as librarians can also meet with you about there as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, Morpho basically creates a catalog of different descriptions that you can query and can build out if you have a bigger, more expansive data set, it can help with the process of making all of that more consistent. Okay. 
Um, so kind of switching gears here, um, thinking about tools for how you can go about collaboratively sharing your data. So we've talked about documenting that data, the importance of that. What are some ways that if you've got this data and you want to share it, that you can use to kind of share the data? What are some things to think about when you're citing data sets or considering authorship, things like that? Um, so, uh, one tool that can be particularly useful for a lot of the data sets that you might generate, GitHub, is actually, if you do programming, you're probably familiar with it uh, for doing program scripts, codes like that. If you're working with large flat files, so CSV files, things like that, not, doesn't really work as well for spreadsheets or Excel sheets and stuff, but if you're working with flat files, GitHub actually does a pretty good job of being able to manage your data, share it between people, keep track of version changes, stuff like that. Um, another great tool uh, that we've had good success with is uh, if you're an R user, OSFR. It's a, uh, uh, so OSF and that stands for Open Science Framework, which I'll talk about in a second as a data repository tool, and then R, the programming language. Um, it's actually a full kind of project management suite that integrates with your R scripts, also integrates with OSF and it storage things if you're doing that. Um, so you can take the time to learn something like that um, that will help you manage all of your projects, share that data publicly or privately. Um, and this is just a couple of examples of tools that do things like this. They may or may not be the right tools for you, but that's something that meeting with librarians can sit down with you, talk about what you need, and we can help you find the right tools for you. <clears throat> okay, um, citing your data. Uh, so more and more commonly, data sets are becoming an actual citable thing. So you generate these data sets, you cite them. Uh, there's increasingly tools to help you cite, track those citations like there are for papers, publications, things like that. Uh, and you want to give credit to people for using their data. Um, it encourages people to share that data as well if there's tangible benefits to them for sharing it. Um, so a lot of times it's a lot like uh, a, you know, citing a paper or something like that. You want to do the year that it's there, um, the creator, uh, when it was published, what the title of it is, the format of it, if it has a DOI, linking that sort of stuff so people can find it. Um, but just kind of basic uh, citation things there. So it might look something like this. Uh, you know, who the creator is, parentheses when it was published, uh, the title of it, the format, and then an identifier. Um, so thinking about how you're citing this data as you're sharing it so that way other people can access that data and use it. And then also, as we're getting ready to start thinking about specific repositories, how those let your data be cited and shared. Um, so there's an example of that template. Okay, uh, lastly here, and how much time do I have? 15, okay, so I may get done a little early with lots of time for questions, which is probably good for second to last talk. Um, what I want to kind of talk through here is we've talked about um, uh, why we should document our data, citing that data, things like that. Uh, I want to give you some ideas of some different tools that are out there that you might want to consider that might be good fits for you to actually start doing this, to places to start documenting your data, places to start depositing it so it's available, um, and to kind of walk through what some of these options are, how they work, just for, so you can get kind of a feel for the landscape uh, of the different tools that are out there. Um, so uh, these data repositories are gonna oftentimes provide you with preferred methods of sharing. Um, so it's gonna be in a consistent way that people, kind of a language that people can understand. Uh, it makes your data more discoverable than a supplemental information file at the end of your paper. Um, I know I've tried to find essay files from a paper and sometimes, sometimes it's really easy, it's linked right there, sometimes you have to scour the journal's website to finally dig up where that SI is. Um, so putting in this, it's gonna show up in search engines, Google, things like that, so people can find your data. Um, this is increasingly becoming a requirement for funding agencies and journals. Um, this isn't as relevant to y'all, but the National Institutes of Health has just instituted, or will be instituting in January, a huge data management and data sharing requirement for anybody who's getting funding from them. And a lot of other federal funders are probably gonna stop, start following suit there. And so if you're not thinking about how you're depositing this data, where you're putting it, things like that, it could make it harder to get funding in the future. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, and this is something librarians can help you with, how you identify a repository. Um, thinking about funder requirements can also be something that you might need to put into there. Some funders might require it. 
Uh, also, licensing can be a big thing to think about with your data, how you want to share it, how you can share that data, things like that, and different repositories are going to be better or worse for those sort of things. All right, so options for y'all. Um, so Open Science Framework, this, I'll just say my bias, this is my personal favorite. I love OSF. Um, it's a really cool tool. Um, I'm framing these as potential pros and potential cons because there's no one perfect data management repository for anyone. Um, it depends on your personal preferences, your own skills and comfort levels, um, what you can and can't do with your project, what your collaborators are or aren't willing to do, things like that. So what may be a pro for me may be a con for you or vice versa. Um, but I tried to frame this within kind of thinking about the different groups that might be here. Um, so OSF, Open Science Framework, it's at osf.io. Um, it has numerous integrations. Uh, so you can integrate Google Drive, um, GitHub, uh, Orchid. Those are just three that come off the top of my head. There's at least a dozen different tools or packages that integrate in seamlessly with it. Um, so it gives you a ton of flexibility with what you can do within it. Um, it's also, compared to some of the other ones I'm talking about, going to be very flexible in its uses. It's a data repository, but it can also solve, serve as a project management software. It can serve as a virtual lab notebook. Um, it can serve as a wiki to give information about things. Um, so it's very, very flexible in how you can use it and what you can do with it. Um, it has a 50-year preservation fund, um, so it's set up by the Center for Open Science. They have set aside enough money and keep a fund updated so that uh, if the Sh Center for Open Science shuts down tomorrow, the tool will still be running for 50 years from that day. So you have 50 years to move your data to another repository or you know, to retire and not care about it. Uh, at any rate, by the time it shuts down, it's probably not going to be a problem for you anymore. Um, and then it's compatible with any type of file. It doesn't really care what the files are. You can put them in there. It's going to upload them and uh, take care of them. It also supports any kind of license you want, so you can apply any of the Creative Commons licenses to it, more restrictive licenses. You can make things public or private based on if you want other people to be able to search them and find them. Um, some cons to it. Uh, so it uh, is free. This is, it's free. Um, there's a five gigabyte limit for private projects, a 50 gigabyte limit for uh, public projects. So they're encouraging people to be public by giving you more storage for free if you make your projects public. But there's also no limit on how many projects you can have on the platform. So you can very easily skirt around this cost if you don't mind having multiple nested projects or something like that. But if you've got files that are you know, over five or 50 gigabytes, and you don't want to do the work of nesting them in multiple projects or something like that, you might have to pay for storage beyond that um, initial cost there. Um, it does have a bit of a utilitarian interface. Um, so because it's so flexible, um, it can be a little bit, it's not very appified, it's not super streamlined, it can be a little chuggy sometimes just because it's so big. Um, so it can take a little bit of training, a little bit of getting used to, to learn how to use it. Um, but then once you do, there's a lot of power behind that interface. Um, and yeah, those are kind of the major downsides to it there. Um, <clears throat> Ag Data Commons is another repository that may be useful to many of you. Um, it's specific to ag research, so one of the benefits of using this is that it's going to have a lot of other research that may be for the ag-oriented people in here um, very closely aligned. Uh, it's run by the USDA, so you have kind of the backing of a federal agency there who's going to, you know, secure the back end. They'll even help you with data curation there as well to make sure that your data is curated through time. Um, and it's going to be really easy in searching this to find related research if you're in the ag area. If you're not in ag, probably not uh, as good a choice for you. Um, some cons, it is a smaller repository, so it's not necessarily as well known as some of these others. Um, it does require, which again, this may or may not be a con to you, but it does require a Creative Commons Zero license, which essentially puts the data into the public domain. I'm a librarian, so I think that's a great thing. Everything should be open and free to share. But uh, there may be other people who have different needs, different things like that, who having a Creative Commons license on that wouldn't be ideal for you. Um, Dryad is another big one that I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. Um, it's more of a multidisciplinary one, so it's not as specific. 
Um, for some of you in this room, uh, a big pro is going to be that the University of California system is an institutional member to this. Uh, so that gives you a lot of perks, free access, things like that. So if you're in the UC system, uh, it's going to work really well for you probably. Um, it does have GitHub integration, so if you're doing lots of coding, scripts like that, you can integrate your GitHub directly into it. It's great with geospatial data, um, so it's got a lot of special, special tools and things like that um, that are going to make geospatial data good. Uh, it has community-led curation, uh, so there is efforts to curate in, uh, the data in a uh, consistent way. And then most file formats are going to be accepted there. Um, if you're not a member, uh, if you're not at the UC and the institution you're associated with is not a member, then uh, you're either going to have to get your institution to join or you're going to have to work with people who you may be collaborating with in this group who are institutional members to deposit it through them. Um, so that's a bit of a con there. And like the others, it does require a CC0 license. How am I doing? Good. All right. Uh, Two more here, and we're kind of working down to some of the smaller, more niche ones here. Uh, the Knowledge Network for Biocomplexity. Um, this is an NSF-supported one, so again, you have the backing of a big federal agency who's kind of running or supporting this uh, repository. Uh, it's specifically designed for environmental and ecological data, um, so if that's more your niche, um, this may be a great database to put things into. Um, it integrates with the tool I talked about earlier, Morpho, so especially if you want to have more rigorous metadata around your things, if you have funder requirements, funder requirements around that or things like that, this may be a great choice for you. Um, it's good with geospatial data, and like OSF, it also has a disaster fund, uh, so if it goes under tomorrow, it's going to exist for some amount of time. I didn't uh, see how long that was, uh, but it is there. Um, some potential cons, it does again require that uh, Creative Commons license. It's not as well known as a lot of the others, so, you know, if you're going to the, uh, which, uh, if you're going to, you know, the conferences and saying I use the Knowledge Network for Biocomplexity, you may be kind of the hipster data person there. Oh, I use a data repository, but it's one you've never heard of. Um, and then it's missing a lot of the other pros that the others have, so um, it may not have some of those strengths that you're looking for in some of those others. Uh, the last one here, the Environmental Data Initiative, um, supported by NSF as well, designed for, again, ecological environmental data. Uh, it does have built-in uh, kind of support for data curation, and so there's people there that are thinking about how to make sure your data is preserved through time. So if having that data exist for long periods of time in a well-accessible way is important, they can help you with that. Um, it does use and require the ecological metadata language, metadata language um, which is EML. So you are, it has a very specific requirement for how you put your metadata in there. Um, if you already use that, that's great. If you don't mind learning it, that's great. If you don't want to learn EML in order to put your data in, that could be an obstacle to using this. It also does have some limitations on data size, so you'll want to check out and make sure if you're producing very large files that it's going to be suitable for you there. Uh, and like the others, it does require that Creative Commons license. So, that was just kind of an overview, um, just some things to think about. Um, uh, I'm happy to take questions now. You can reach out to me. Um, you can also, if you take your phone out, there's a Google form there, and if this is something that you're like, yes, I want to talk about this later, you can put in a request with me and let me know when you'll be thinking about this, when you have a grant deadline or something like that, and I'll reach out to you at that time and say, hey, you said you wanted to talk about data or something, get in touch with you to try and help you out. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm happy to take questions. Librarians are here to help. Um, please reach out to us. We want to help you make your data awesome. Yes. So my question has to do with public domain yes. As public employees, is not all of our work part of the public domain? Is there something that wouldn't, for some reason, wouldn't be in the public domain? Are you even allowed to do something that wouldn't be in the public domain? Yeah, um, I would. I would hope so. Um, I don't have that answer off the top of my head, but we actually do have at the UC Davis Library a librarian there who specializes in these sorts of questions. Um, so if uh, I would think so that there's to some extent, but then there's also some things around patents and things like that, that some data may be collected one way or another, or some people may not know what data they need to share and things like that. Um, so if that's a question that you want to talk more on, definitely get in touch with me. I can put you in touch with uh, 
we have someone who deals with copyright and stuff like that exclusively at the library. So, yeah. 